Douglas Castro, what is Neural DSP? Neural DSP is a music technology company focused on leveraging powerful and relatively new technologies to empower musicians to be more creative. Welcome to Inference, an AI business podcast by Silo AI. I'm Ville Hulko, co-founder of Silo, the largest private AI lab in the Nordics that focuses on building human-centric AI for businesses. With me today is Douglas Castro. Douglas is the founder and CEO of Neural DSP, the industry-leading professional-grade sound processing company. Neural DSP is known for its impeccable software-based guitar and bass amp simulations, and Neural is one of the earliest and leading applicators of machine learning in sound processing. Douglas is also a known pioneer in the industry. His other company, Dark Class Electronics, has created the de facto sound behind modern rock bass tones, used by artists such as Foo Fighters, Nolly Get Good, and Faith No More. Doug, it really is a privilege to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So it's a bit of a fanboy moment for me, so I know exactly who you are, as I probably use your products more than I use Netflix. But for the rest of the people who are listening, uh, could you give us an insight into your background? So who are you and what do you do? Sure. Um, I am from South America, from Chile. Um, so I am an immigrant. I've been here for 13 years now. And in November, it'll be 13 years, so plus and a half. I am also a musician, been a bass player for 20 years and a guitarist for about one year. And I'm also an electronics engineer. So I'm really passionate about music and technology and engineering. I love making new things, whether it's writing a song, well, not anymore, but when I was younger, or designing products, coming up with a vision for a product or a service, and then figuring out how to make it happen. Uh, and that also transpires to creating brands and teams and, and companies. So I, I just like starting things from scratch, things that I think could be useful, interesting, and fun, uh, and challenging. And yeah, I, I combine sort of these passions for creating new things, some technical know-how, uh, an insight, uh, my passion for music, and, and try to yeah make incredible products for musicians. With Neural DSP, we sort of have these two two main lines, which are the opposite ends of, of the spectrum if you play guitar or bass. With our software products, we digitize really, really expensive and rare equipment, amplifiers, microphones, pedals that you know are not even available. And even if they were, you'd have to spend tens of thousands of years to purchase. We're sort of at the uncanny value already, like indistinguishable from the real thing versions in software. Uh, and then you are able to buy this equipment for a hundred years or a bit over a hundred years. So it's a sort of, uh, my estimate is a hundred X reduction in price for, for the same value, right? The, the same options. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then on the hardware side, which is our, we, we, have, we sort of developed our own computer which processes all the sound and conditions all the signals. So it's self-sufficient with a touchscreen. And that's on the very fancy side of, of things. And that's a couple grand, basically. Uh, but it has everything you'd want and, and more. So, uh, yeah, you know, although we're a, a software company with a heavy emphasis on signal processing, algorithm research, and machine learning, uh, we're not afraid of hardware. We design a lot of hardware. And we have our own manufacturing as well. So it's sort of a, a quite vertically integrated, diverse company in many ways. So basically, you take the amplifiers and sounds that used to be forced to invest 4,000 euros to get and now make it available as basically a digital twin for about 100 euros. Yeah, and, and more, right? Because the amplifier is that, but then you have a few speaker cabinets, you know, at a couple grand, you have, mm -hmm. and you know, the microphones we use for capturing the speaker response is, is it can be thousands because some, some of these mics are really rare and expensive. If you have the pedal scene, I think that the math always adds up to about 10 grand that we had to you know, spend to, to buy the original equipment to model it. Uh, yeah. And then we sell it for a hundred bucks. So it's a good deal. Uh, and also an, another thing that, that we really, that for me is very important. So it's been, I've always been very, uh, although I have a technical background in, in electronics mm -hmm. engineering, I've always considered myself not so much of a scientist or, or, or even an engineer, but more of an artist. Like I've always, I used to write poetry and, and read lots of literature. And, and, and before I got into music and electronics, I used to paint and draw. Mm. So aesthetics have always been very, very important to me. And, and interestingly enough, even now when I you know, learn anymore, because I have people that are better than me at that, but back in the day when I would design the schematics for a Douglas pedal, early Douglas products, mm. uh, sometimes I made decisions that were very unorthodox from an electronics best practice point of view, but I would choose to do them because I thought the schematic looked 
better. Like it, it was more yeah. aesthetically pleasing. And the schematics mm -hmm. are super top secret. Like nobody would ever see this. But I really wanted to know that when I looked at the box, knowing that everything about it was beautiful up to the abstraction of the circuit, which is the schematic. And, and I think that that's very reflected on our products as well. Um, I, I think our planes are not only really, really, really good sounding. Uh, I, I, of course, I'm really biased. I think they're the best sounding ones. Uh, but that's arguable because sound is mm. very subjective. But I think it's really hard to argue that they're the best looking guitar plugins on the market. Like nothing else yeah. comes even close. Uh, and I think that's very inspiring because at the end, I don't know, man, like the you play guitar. So the audience, you know, if you're playing a gig, they won't know whether you're using a Kemper or... Uh, or a fractal audio probably, or, or you know, if you're mm. if you're using a quad cortex or a helix or a real amp on a really good modeler, the audience mm. doesn't know. Like the, the, this is a misconception. It's like the, the audience doesn't need to know. The gear is for the player, not for the audience. Uh, mm. it, it's how do you feel knowing that you're playing through gear that you find inspiring? That I think yeah. that that has a very direct impact on on the experience the audience has when they're watching you play live. Or how you perform when you're, you know, cutting tracks in the studio. And I really believe that the products need to be far more than very, very functional and intuitive, but also need to be inspiring. And I think mm. the visual aspect of that is very important. So I really, you know, my co-founder Francisco, who runs the, the entire plugin development and also a lot of the quad cortex stuff, he, he's, he's our chief product officer. So I think that we always emphasize is that when you open a new plugin for, you know, you're getting the trial or, or, or buying it when it's released. The first thing you see has to be like, holy cow, this is gorgeous. You know, before you yes. play one note, you're really like, oh, man, this is going to be good. And I think that sort of sets everything up for people to have a very fun and enjoyable experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I you know, if the plugin sounds crap, like it's not going to do much. But if everything yeah. else is there, you know, the features are there, the sound is there. Just having this like visual gratification when you use it is just, I feel, runs up the experience and makes it very formidable. So we really try to create a special experiences when users use our products and and a lot of the work we do is you know with quad cortex for example a lot of the focus we have now it's uh it's not perfect that there are many aspects in which the user experience is not nowhere near perfect and we're focusing mm -hmm. a lot on that actually it's like decrapping it <laughs> making it yeah. closer to to perfect i mean it has a i i don't know i'm not sure if you've tried it but it has amazing things i couldn't use anything else uh, I mm -hmm. believe it's the best product of its kind in the market, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect by any means. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it, with the aesthetics, like if you consider how Nero exists, like the way that I see it, you basically live in a symbiosis with the artists and the amp makers, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, you looking beautiful and your products looking beautiful are an extension of the look of the artists themselves. So, you know, not only is it like a commercial thing, but it's probably a very big factor why the best in the best of the industry choose to work with you guys, aside of the sound too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and you know... I think that, I mean, it, it's pretty sort of intuitive, but is that a lot of these big artists, you know, musicians, mm. uh, they're also very, very invested in the aesthetics of, of their, you know, yeah. brands as musicians. They um, they put a lot of effort, almost as much effort on the artwork for their albums uh, as they do on the music itself and the production of the music. And what we find is that uh, our design team, which I believe is the best in the industry as well, something that they're like magical at is, is through talking with the artists and, and you know, exchanging ideas and, and they're able to capture the vision of the artist because at the end, these artists mm. are great musicians and they might have like a clear sense for the, what their aesthetics are, the vibe, but they're not designers necessarily. So yeah. but our, our guys are really good at grasping these abstract guidelines and creating something that's, it's entirely the artist's vision, but it's better than they would have ever expected. Uh, and that's why all of our plugins, in a way, look similar because they're designed by the same industrial designers and graphic designers. Yeah. But they also all look different because they're all done with different artists that have different mm. philosophies and sense of, of aesthetic. So that is really enjoyable. Like, I really look forward to when the guys are working on, on a new plugin is where will this go now? So yeah, it, it's, it's very cool. Moving towards machine learning. So you, you use machine learning as one of the key technologies within yep. your old DSP. And in the amplification world, like first you had the tube amplification with the Marshall stacks on AC, DC stages. Then you had the semiconductor based amps that were accessible to basically every bedroom. And now it's creeping toward amp sims for every laptop. So basically a piece of software, a piece of plugin within your computer that makes the sound that you needed to have the ACDC stacks for it before. So mm -hmm. can you talk about what the software-based AMP simulation is? Just explain it out loud and what the significance of machine learning is for that. 
Sure. So, I mean, I, I think it's important to say that the EDL amplifier, cube amplifier emulation has been around for 25 years. But it's like 90s. It, it's nothing new. Our approach is new because we're doing it in a very different way. So that, that's just uh, wanted to clarify that we didn't invent amplifier simulation. Mm-hmm. I mean, companies have been doing it since I was in elementary school. Uh, yes. Okay, so basically an amplifier is it, it's a chain of stages, uh, gain stages that amplify the signal and filter the signal so that your very small guitar output is loud enough to move electrically, has enough energy to move a speaker so that it can be heard by a lot of people. That, that's sort of, roughly speaking, what an amplifier does. The thing is that the perfect amplifier doesn't exist. So there are all, all sorts of really unintended, uh, originally intended and originally undesired effects such as distortion and, and nonlinear frequency responses and, and really, really weird stuff uh, that became part of the character of, of what guitar is supposed to sound like. Mm. It's very interesting because now we spent months trying to recreate an effect that engineers in the 60s were, were, were trying to get rid of <laughs> because mm-hmm. it wasn't like sort of technically good to have. That's sort of like, like a very ironic uh, part of what we do now is that we're yeah. spending you know millions on R&D and, and having lots of people with really high IQs and, and lots of degrees <laughs> trying to recreate something that you know Rupert Neve was trying to get rid of at all costs <laughs> 60 years ago. Imperfection by nature. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but at the end, of the, that's music, right? Like it's art, art is not perfect. Like <laughs> anyway, I, I'm deviating. Um, so yeah, modeling amplifiers are as machines themselves. Mm. They're pretty simple. Like the topologies are very simple, but they're creating... Mm. There's like a few number of components do all sorts of really strange things that, that actually recreating that behavior mathematically can be extremely, extremely difficult. Well, modeling a system is very difficult. Like that wasn't it that until very recently, we didn't have really accurate models for how would smoke dissipate through air, right? And it's something mm-hmm. that any human can see it and, and have an intuitive understanding of, of how it works and even make some crude predictions of where will the smoke go depending on what direction the wind is blowing and, and, and how bright is the flame. Uh, but it took a lot of time and energy and technology to model that and, and be able to predict the behavior. Something similar happens with amplifiers. My background is in designing these analog systems. And I can tell you that the people that make models of these understand my products way better than I do, for example. Mm-hmm. Like way better because there are things that, there are decisions that I made uh, that were just like, yeah, that was the best sounding component, cheap number, or mm-hmm. that was the right amount of game because I made an aesthetic decision. They need to understand sort of almost like an uh, not on like a physics level, but pretty close mm. how what everything in the circuit is doing, because then you need to translate that into you know a set of differential equations, and then mm-hmm. you need to write some C plus plus code that will solve these differential equations in real time. And if your your mathematical if your understanding of the circuit is good enough and your mathematical model is close enough to the behavior that you understood from the circuit, and if your code is good enough to <laughs> solve these efficiently in real time, then you have a good sounding amplifier model uh, but it requires a mm. full stack skills all the way from low hardware level understanding to dsp mathematics and, and also most likely c plus plus and actually if you want to run these things on, a, on an embedded system like a quad cortex you because your code is, is you write code on on, on a laptop right so your c plus plus code is probably not compiled to optimally run on a different chip like a shark processor like we're using quad cortex for example mm. so then in many cases there's lots of assembly level optimization as well so so you sort of have like the full stack all the way from hardware to higher level code and, and everything in between so it, it's very difficult to do uh modeling amplifiers very difficult to do because uh it's very difficult to find people that can understand a circuit you know at that level with that level of granularity that also have the dsp and the mathematics background and that also have the c plus plus proficiency the right efficient models and then if you have the sort of assembly level optimization factor in then then you're you know there's like five dudes in the whole world that like not not five but you know it's like tens of people that that can do it really really well and i think that's why there are very very few companies in the world are doing modeling out of like you know world-class level i would say there's like five companies and the engineers combined is probably you know 50 (laughs) or or maybe 100 tops so that's a traditional sort of dsp modeling approach uh, what we realized in the beginning was that this was very, very, that was definitely not, not going to work for us because we wanted to do this quad cortex hardware product since the beginning. And, you know, for that, we needed hundreds of amplifiers or at least dozens of amplifiers. And it took our world-class DSP PhD guys two months to model an amplifier. 
So mm. the math didn't really add up because we barely had any money and we would need probably on our timeline for the quad quarter was two years. So mm. we would have needed more engineers than probably exist in the whole world that we couldn't even afford mm. it, if, even if you could convince them to recruit them all. And we probably would have needed five times the, the amount of, of time uh, to complete the project. So the conventional approach wasn't going to work in the time frame we had and with the resources constraints we had. So the only option we had left was actually try to automate the entire, like automate the entire process. And that's when machine learning sort of became this kind of like last resort, which at the end, you know, this is 2017, 2018, there wasn't much, you know, literature or even people playing around with sort of automated modeling using uh, machine learning. It was very new at the time. And we we're lucky enough to run into a few folk from Alto. Mm. It was this perfect combination between people from the acoustics lab that had an incredible understanding of the conventional DSP side of things, meeting up with some people from the speech side of, of Alto, who also mm. were really passionate about guitar and music. So there was this sort of like perfect combination between passion for music, deep understanding of electronics and DSP mathematics, and, mm. you know, world class proficiency in speech synthesis and then sort of like machine learning, which is sort of like a very, probably the most developed intersection of audio and, and machine learning currently speech in general, I mean, recognition and synthesis. So, yeah, we were very lucky that these two people met and I was very lucky to meet them at a party actually at Alto. And yeah, they helped a lot. I mean, the company was already going on and we were doing products with the conventional approach. Uh, but mm -hmm. these people were really like a, you know, like like a catalyst to to a lot of, of great things. Um, so yeah, we were able to automate the whole process. So instead of having, you know, two PhDs, look at a schematic and risking electrocution by probing an amplifier that's powered with 500 volts uh, and then we're doing a bunch of math and a bunch of code we just designed some robots that turn the knobs we design probing signal that it's very long uh, and it generates all the training data you need so we just run this it's few hours worth of signals uh, the robots move all the knobs and we record all of that and if you're lucky in a few hours you have a model of an amplifier. It sounds exactly the same as the original in a way that I've never seen before. Well, one thing we need to understand, mm. particularly with tube amplifiers, is that when you're doing a white box model, meaning that you you know you have access to the schematic and everything, when you're analyzing the schematic, you're sort of basing everything on, on ideal values of everything, right? You, you don't take into mm. account component tolerances, for example, which are huge. Output transformers are super, super, super variable and subject to all sorts of nonlinear behavior. There are a lot of character mm. to the sound of the amplifier. That's not really even understood how or why. So th there are physics there that we don't completely understand yet. I don't mm. think we'll ever understand because there's just not enough financial incentive for anyone to dedicate, you know, a lot of research into understanding what are the effects of an output transformer on your Marshall amplifier. Like that's just <laughs> it, it's not worth mm -hmm. the scientific pursuit at this stage. So the another one that, that our approach has combined with, you know, automating and being more efficient is that if you can hear the effect that any component has on the signal, we will mm -hmm. recreate it. We don't need to understand the physics behind it. We don't need to, you know, start thinking about, you know, hysteresis and, and electromagnetic mm -hmm. core saturation on this. We don't care about any of that. Is the speaker fully linear or does it have a non-linear region? You know, does it saturate? We don't care because if the microphone picks it up, our model will uh, will take that behavior into account and, and it'll be a part of the model. So the advantage, it's sort of like this exponential, exponentially better approach in that it's more accurate than anyone else's. And it also takes probably 1% of the resources that like time and, and energy and, and talent uh, than anyone else's. So yeah. It, it was a game changer. But now in, in hindsight, it was a brilliant move on, on our end. But, you know, four years ago, we were all pretty sure that it wasn't going to work. But, you know, the, the alternative was certainly not going to work. So yeah. if one has a, you know, 0% success rate and the other option has a 10% success rate, 10% looks pretty good. And that's why we ended up relying so heavily on, on, on machine learning. And the, the other cool thing is that it's opening a lot of other doors. I mean, the quad core has mm. this really cool feature called Neural Capture, which allows users to create their own black box models of their gear, pedals and amplifiers. So we don't even need to model everything ourselves. Users can, if they have an amplifier that they like, but you know, the amplifier is really big and bulky, or maybe it's a very rare and expensive amplifier. You don't want to bring it to a shitty bar where people might throw beer at it. You can just make mm. captures of their amplifier. You, you know, digitize it. 
it's like scanning it, right? Uh, you, you scan your amplifier, now it's stored on your device. And now you can take the amplifier that you love, you know, your $5,000 super rare Martian amplifier, you leave it safe at home or in your rehearsal room, and you take the digital version up to the quad cortex. And on top of that, you also create a, a, a sort of a cloud service. Each quad cortex is connected to the cloud. So uh, we have an app where people can create a profile and share and, and exchange these captures and, and presets as well. So so there's a community component to to the Cortex experience, which is very cool. If you I don't know, if you want to learn a Meshuga song, you can actually go to the Cortex cloud and look for Meshuga presets or captures mm. of, of, of amplifiers that Meshuga uses and you can sort of mm. nail the tone. And th that is like super, super cool. Now this, I absolutely love that from AI's perspective, because if you go back in the recent machine learning history, like one of the most common ways that an industrial level AI conversation started usually was that an organization decided that we need machine learning now. We have a very strong idea that this is going to be competitive advantage for us. We really don't know how, we really don't know why, but we just know that we need to start exploring with this, which often led to very, very skewed starting points in how, and you know, kind of just a common misconception about what AI is in the whole process. Like it's it's not a default by itself. It's just a catalyst to make something a little bit more efficient, right? But basically what you're describing about the genesis of neural DSP is you took a look at the process, you already had a problem that you needed to solve and you just figured, okay, so there isn't really any other sensible way for us to go about this than to try out machine learning kind of as a last resort option, which in a sense is the purest way of starting to implement the new technology, right? Because you're completely unencumbered by any of the hype, any of the expectations, any of the anything except trial and error and see how it floats. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that I really loved about what you describe is the theory versus the practical side. So with the traditional side of pursuing with mathematics and traditional modeling first, you take a look at some of the theoretical values that you get from the components themselves and you try to replicate them in a mathematical way. Whereas if you start to do signals processing to the actual sound that comes from the device using machine learning there, you're kind of not as encumbered with the theoretical maxims as you are just with the actual raw sound, the raw input that comes out from the device. So, you know, not only is it a more efficient way of reaching the same end goal, the end goal is actually as a derivative slightly better than it would be using an alternative method. Mm -hmm. And going back to the Genesis days of Neural DSP, like if we take a look at years 2015, 16, 17, 18, and so forth, um, when machine learning started to become a thing and started to become discussed again industry-wise, like how did the music industry look back in the day from machine learning's perspective? Was this the technology commonly discussed or available? What was the status there? So I, I can give you a very sort of clear indicator of, of how quickly... Now it's very common, but but it, it exploded very quickly. So uh, first year of Neural DSP 2018, uh, me and then he was our machine learning guy, but now he leads the, the machine learning team. Mm. Tan, uh, he's a Greek, Finnish, brilliant engineer, and neuroscientist. Uh, we went to the biggest uh, digital audio music DSP conference called DAFX. It's in Europe mm. every year. It's a journal as well. And once a year, there's a conference. People submit papers. And each, you know, paper gives a 20 minute presentation. It's very cool. Um, it, it's like 50, 50 academia and industry. So, you know, you'll meet the DSP guys from Ableton, Native Instruments, Isotope, like all these amazing companies. And also you'll meet sort of their professors mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, that sort of like the new generation of, of PhD candidates and postdocs uh, doing interesting things. So it, it's a great place to be in the loop of, of where the industry is going in terms of like, you know, the very, very core technology. And also get to meet all these people. Every, of course, every day there's a dinner and, and bars, and, and it's just a it, it's a great place to be. Uh, mm. So we went for the first time in 2018 because a lot of our friends from other companies and from the from Alta were going. So we we joined. It was just the two of us. It was in Portugal. Uh, out of 100 papers or 100 presentations, there was one that that sort of uh, mentioned machine learning for audio purposes, and it was by a lead uh, engineer at Isotope. And Isotope has been uh, they, they've been one of the pioneers and actually incorporating. Uh, machine learning for audio solutions, but they are focused on smart plugins that allow you to automate production processes. Uh, very different to mm. to our application. That was it. So that's 2018. 2019, we go back a year later, mm. and 90 presentations were 
machine learning audio related and 10 were not. <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it literally, it, it sort of exploded 90 fold uh, in a year, um, yeah. which is crazy. Uh, and, and, and now I think DSP engineers are actually very smart people. So I, I'm sure some are just using machine learning to try to see if they can sexify, uh, make their work sexier and, and you know, more mm-hmm. marketable mm-hmm. or just for fun. But there's also now, now there's a lot of really, really smart people on the DSP side who are playing around with, you know, combining traditional machine learning techniques uh, with audio processing. So, I mean, the interesting thing is that signal processing, right? You can be talking about electromagnetic radio signals, image processing, thermal imaging, <laughs> video processing, mm-hmm. or music. And, and at the end, you know, a filter is a filter. A transfer function is a transfer function. And now sort of all, all the core mathematics uh, principles, mathematical principles for signal processing are quite universal, actually. Mm. And actually, I think that's been a really key thing on, on our work. So our engineers have borrowed solutions from image processing, for example, a lot, or from speech. You know, this is for making guitar products. So mm. the fact there's so much investment and, and much more literature on, on machine learning applications for solving problems in other fields has enabled a lot of our sort of solutions or has inspired a lot of our solutions. So, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and talking about the kind of the team that you have inside. So as you go about creating a company that produces machine learning simulated amps, essentially, like what does your team composition look like today? How much of those people are machine learning versus others? Like what's the concoction? So, I mean, I would say it's probably 50-50, the machine learning team. And, you know, all the machine learning guys are also DSP guys. So which mm-hmm. is a huge advantage. Uh, they could do both. So they could model amplifiers on the conventional approach just as well as, as they can do, you know, cutting edge machine learning things. So that's handy. Uh, in addition to that, we have four or five, like really, really, actually six really senior DSP guys, you know, who, who have a, a decade or two of experience. The machine mm-hmm. learning guys are, are, are younger, you know, they're all sort of mid thirties to mid twenties. Mm-hmm. And the DSP guys are, you know, like a decade on average, a decade older. But yeah, it's about the same sort of like six and six, basically. Uh, that's like kind of like the core algorithm re- research team. And the that actually, that, that is very, very cool because we have this like, you know, the commercial DSP guys who are also geniuses and very, very, very senior experienced um, who help these crazy young geniuses with all these like really insane ideas implement mm-hmm. their ideas in a way that's practical and efficient. Uh, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of mutual respect. So like one of our most brilliant uh, machine learning guys was talking to our sort of our senior DSP guy. Uh, and the machine learning guy told me that, dude, Rob, every time I talk to Rob, I get the feeling that he's forgotten more about DSP than I will ever learn. And Rob, like the same day told me like, dude, Tom's code is, I've never seen anything like this. This is brilliant, new. Like there's a very like, there, there's, I think in many companies and many cultures, you can have a clash between sort of like the old school mm. guys and, and the, the new wave. Uh, here, nearly is the opposite. There's like, not in spite of the differences, but because of their differences, there's like, a, their differences are a huge source of respect and admiration, yeah. mutual. Uh, and, and I think that's been a key part of our, uh, of us making it work, actually, because you need, you know, Rob has 20 years of experience doing, you know, assembly level shark DSP implementation. So you might need people like that if you're super awesome algorithm is, you know, written Python. <laughs> you, you need to sort of yeah. recreate it, you know, like, eight layers below that uh, for it to run on a quad cortex, for example. So, but yeah, that, that sort of like full stack and diverse background of, of, of the agri research team mm. is it, very important. It merits to, for a moment, toot the horn of Finland in terms of AI, if you will, because, you know, both are Finnish enterprises. Um, back in the day before Silo was founded in 2017, I was living in Silicon Valley at the time and we had another AI company there and we were kind of taking a look at the client of the, both the global and the local Silicon Valley AI scene. And one of the things that we accidentally discovered is that the absolute level of Nordic and Finnish machine learning talent, kind of what you're describing, is actually really bloody competitive. Oh, if if you kind of class. benchmark it, um, like even to the highest highest standard of the highest standard markets, like for example in California. So you know, finding those teams like. Uh, it's like, ironically enough, even though Finland is a very desolate market, like when you talk about machine learning implementation, it is it is a huge asset that we have here locally. Absolutely. And, and you know, on the DSP side as well, uh, Tampere mm. and, and Alto have world-class PhD programs for audio. Mm. You know, you have these, a few professors running the, you know, this 
uh, departments who are legendary, you know, like their eminence is yeah. world, world recognized authorities in the subject. And what that yeah. allows is that, you know, local talent have, you know, a pipeline to get a world class training in, in whatever they want to pursue in their PhDs or even masters. But it also attracts mm -hmm. a lot of foreign talent. You know, if you're a, a talented Italian or, or you know, British PhD engineer, actually doing your master's or PhD at Aldo is very appealing, or, or at Temple University is very appealing because yeah, yeah. the program is very competitive. So a lot of our DSP people, you know, from Finland, from Aldo are, are not Finns. They're people that mm. moved here five years ago to, again, get their master's or the PhD, and they just stuck around. Um, like the Aldo Acoustics Lab is like our secret weapon, actually, because there's like this <laughs> sort of like genius factory there that, you know, every year the, 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 there's like, like, you know, at least a couple really brilliant world-class uh, engineers that, that, you know, you can try to recruit and, and bring over. So, yeah. Yeah, like like even the smaller universities here, like Olo University up in next yeah. to the Arctic Circle, like Olo University's head of computer vision, Matti Pietikainen, like for the longest time, he used to outside Fei Fei Li, who was like Google's, Stanford's head of computer vision and Google's head of AI, I think, wow. for a long time. And like at Turku University, there's Turku NLP, um, which I think a year or two ago, like, entered a competition to benchmark their language agnostic NLP parser against 26 top universities around the whole world, like Singapore, Stanford, Prague, um, like all of the tops. And Turku came out like aggregate score number one. And, you know, the funny thing is not a single newspaper has ever written any articles about these. So these are still kind of like the hidden industrial gems that are located like somewhere here far away in the peripheries. But yeah, go Finland, I suppose. Um, and moving on to the practical side of implementing ML, like I'd love to gouge out some of the lessons learned that you guys have had in terms of machine learning management and development, like over the path of neural DSP. So can you talk about some of the challenges that you've faced? Because I can only imagine that starting to implement machine learning into AmSims, like theoretically sounds simple, but practically is everything but. So is there something that you'd love to share with us kind of, oh, we wish we kind of knew this four years ago type of things? That's a very interesting question. I wouldn't change anything because everything sort of had to happen the way it happened. I mean, not knowing how not to do it is, is as important as, as knowing how to do it, actually. Uh, mm. A starting lesson was that uh, first, we weren't sure if the thing could work, like at all. You know, can, can we yeah. actually run a few signals and, and actually create a model that even passes sound, you know, forget about it sounded, you know, credible or, or even close to the source. Mm. Uh, after like a year of failing at that, the guys were able to actually do a study model, you know, like a capture without any controls. That sounded mm -hmm. very, very close to the original amp. And I took days training it uh, on a very, very expensive GP. I mean, expensive sort of still kind of like, like, like a very expensive gaming rig, you know, not, not, not like mm. not, now we have, you know, server rooms, like we have a server room now. Uh, mm. But yeah, it took, you know, days to train on that. And the model took like, you know, 90% of your very fancy MacBook CPU. <laughs> yeah. The thing we realized, and you know, it wasn't even there yet. So what I, what I told the engineers, and we have one guy who was sort of specialized in, in optimization, mm. is okay, we need the training to be, yeah, no, this was like the very first capture prototype, actually, neural capture prototype. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we need to take five minutes instead of, you know, I, I think it was like 10 hours. So we need to take mm -hmm. it five minutes. So the training needs to take five minutes instead of, and I, sorry, it, it wasn't hours. I, I think it was like, it was close to an hour training. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, it took like m most of your CPU. So, okay, we need to make it 10 times faster, like the training itself. So that how mm -hmm. long does that, how long does it take to train the neural network? And the, you know, inference needs to run 10 times more efficiently for it to yeah. be even viable for quad cortex. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you tell an engineer to improve, optimize something by an order of magnitude, they might jump out the window, actually. <laughs> if, yeah. if you tell them that they need to do it by two, you know, a hundredfold increase in, in efficiency, then yeah. they'll definitely jump out. The, they'll go to the elevator, to the top floor to jump out the window. And luckily, these guys are not only brilliant and committed, but they're also relentless and, and very stubborn and they were like mm. it's probably impossible but let's give it a crack and you know in yeah. six months it worked or like maybe a year it worked yeah. so yeah th that was very inspiring because it's very easy for me to say yeah make it a hundred times faster you know it's very very i mean it's very easy for me to i just said it and, and as, as far as i'm concerned that's my, my that's my entire contribution to the effort <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then there is you know 
months and months of really long days and weekends and, and despair and a lot of adversity that I, I'm not even privy to because I don't want to freak me out or, or just, you know, complain to me Yeah, that, that we're involved into that. So yeah, that was very inspiring. And, and, and I'm really proud of these guys. I mean, they're, they're, I have, uh, I have so much respect and admiration for, for most of, for so many people in our team that, that, they're willing to go through things like that. And more than also having the resilience and the, you know, pain tolerance to go through that. Like a lot of the people that may have the pain tolerance may just not be able mm -hmm. to do it because it's a very difficult task to do. Yeah. So to have people that have sort of all these traits is, uh, it makes me feel like I won the lottery, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And the optimization part is like, it's one of those biggest things, I suppose, that even for startups that do machine learning as their core thing to implement it into a product, um, what is often in the beginning of the path completely disregarded is the huge, huge, huge need of optimization later on, especially if you're going to run it on embedded hardware. And there are startups like this in Finland who are like who are working on the first stages and they just know, they see it looming in the horizon, but they kind of want, don't want to touch it before. They, they'll cross the bridge when they get there. But it is a big thing that cannot be disregarded, like if, especially if we are working with edge hardware. Was it difficult to find talent for you guys? Like you described that you found kind of the perfect match with Aalto and with the research groups, um, but like with the concoction of having machine learning capability and DSP capability. So how was it for you guys? Oh yeah, I mean it's a it, it's a constant struggle, especially in the beginning when you have barely any money and no visibility and no traction. So you need to sell people pretty aggressively and you need to be very persuasive. Now, now it's a bit easier because you know we've achieved success and, and well recognized. So a lot of people now come to us. We still mm -hmm. do quite a bit of recruiting and we have, you know, headhunters just trying to poach people from, from, from other companies. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think for the quad cortex period, maybe from the beginning, uh, maybe it took two years until the team was like there, like the, the entire mm -hmm. team we needed to do it. And then it was like one more year of, of, you know, development until it was ready for launch. Yeah. So yeah, I, especially, uh, I mean, DSP, sort of like more conventional DSP and machine learning now, it's a lot easier because there's a lot of a lot of younger guys who are into these things. The, the harder part, on it's the embedded side of things. It's to find mm. people who really love shark assembly. <laughs> and yeah, are really yeah. good at shark assembly. Like that, that's super, super hard to find. So I think we suffered more trying to hire those guys and, and our CTO who was running the Cortex project at the time I think we went through, I think the attrition rate was like 50%. So uh, when we raised our first funding round in 2019, mm. you know, we had like a half a million cash in the bank. So we we're okay. Now we can actually finally hire more embed DSP guys to start optimizing and porting the algorithms to run on Shark for the Quad Cortex. I think in a four month period of time, we hired five engineers, all with mm. excellent credentials and everything. And uh, none of them were, none of them lasted more than two or three yeah, months. Yeah. Because just that the requirements were so intense and you you didn't need like pretty good people, you needed like remarkable people. Yeah. But then yeah, we were able to get like three ninjas, actually two ninjas and one guy who was pretty young, but he was mm. sort of a ninja in the making, you know, yeah. Jiu Jitsu. He was like a purple belt, not a black belt. Yeah. So uh yeah, with some ninja support he, he became a ninja pretty fast. So <laughs> yeah, that, that was like a that and that was like a game changer. That that actually happened in late twenty nineteen. So the first half of 2019 was miserable. We hired a bunch of guys that were really expensive mm. and, and, and very useless. Actually, some of them, like, if they would have done nothing, it would have been better. Like, if they would have just, yeah. you know, invoiced me every month and just watch Netflix all day, it would have been less damaging than, than the work they did. So that was pretty bad. Yeah. In Q4, you know, October uh, 2019, we got the first ninja, and then things got really, really, really good. Um things move a lot faster after that. Yeah, and I suppose that was kind of the situation at the market in general as well. Like before 2017, 2018, like most of the people working around hardcore machine learning were indeed people in the academia. So it was yeah. like companies like Silo, for example, that kind of took a lot of the people under the wing and started to do kind of the conversion work, if you will, about how to make hardcore scientists um, be able to contribute into hardcore industrial projects. Mm -hmm. But now, like once we reach 2019, 2020, 2021, 
the skill is becoming more democratized, right? Like at least the basic level skills of machine learning, like the hardcore expertise is still like rare air, but the basic capabilities are becoming more democratized. And on the other hand, the people who have the high level capability are becoming more able to contribute into private sector projects. So the market is in a really interesting point, like right now and for the past few years, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can give you about democratization. My, my wife mm. is a biologist, molecular microbiologist, PhD from the Zinc University. She works uh, in a big, I can't say the name, but it, it's one of the biggest Finnish companies, like food companies. And she she was wondering if, if there was sort of utility in machine learning techniques for predicting food contamination risk. So, you know, you have all these sort yeah. of indicators, you know, once they pass a threshold or, or a particular combination, can this actually, can you write, you know, an algorithm that will detect that there's high risk here and maybe like set an alarm so that people in the processing facilities, for example, can inspect samples and make sure that the food is safe. And actually, I, I told her like, you know, the same thing that we're discussing is like machine learning should be like the last resort. Like you should try to see if there is any other approach is probably a lot easier to implement and cheaper mm -hmm. to implement that will get you the same or probably an even better result. And actually what she decided to do was to take um, like basic Coursera machine learning course mm. and then some MIT courses. Yeah. And that, now she's writing Python scripts and, and she's <laughs> talking to me about linear regression and matrix yeah. multiplication. And she actually did a proof of concept that actually machine learning might be the best approach for it because she was able to do something that kind of works and she, you know, she's not an expert. But you know, this like five years ago was unthinkable. Like the the threshold for you to even you know, play around with this, with these things. So it's really, you needed to be a specialist in the field or, you know, a master student level in the field. So it's incredible. I think it's one of the upsides of, of the hype. Yeah. Sometimes I justify that machine learning has, uh, you know, we see this with every single big tech wave. It's kind of the same, like there, there is merit to the concept, mm. but people blow it way out of proportion. And then you have these bubbles in the case of 2000, yeah. it was, you know, the dot-com and everything will be on the internet and people really didn't understand what the internet was. It's like people didn't even understand what a website was. All they knew was that you had to have one. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was sort of like this very inflated expectation of, of uh, how financially rewarding would being part of the dot-com movement was. Mm -hmm. And then you had this bubble, things crashed, almost everybody got killed except a very few. And actually those very few were PayPal, Amazon, <laughs> Google. Mm -hmm. I think we saw it... I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, it was remembered. Who, does anybody talk about, about big data anymore? Mm -hmm. I've never heard the term. It was like everywhere was talking like big data here. Like I, in a, in a networking event, I met like 18 big data CEOs. And now <laughs> I, <laughs> now they're all machine learning or actually, well, then there was machine learning or then it was AI for a few years. And now it's all about blockchain. Um, so our, our blockchain and, and now now it's sort of like transitioning from blockchain into Web three, which I don't know. I don't even want to get into that. My blood pressure will will, will increase. Uh, it's it's kind of goofy and it's funny, but I think a big upside is that you know when these things become really hyped and people believe that there's good money and, and a cool factor to it, they mm -hmm. will attract a lot of really smart people to it. Yeah. And I think like in a way a lot of sort of the real life benefits that machine learning already has on, 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 on all of us on a daily basis. It probably would have taken a lot longer or to, to get there or it might have never happened if AI wasn't so hyped up, you know, a mm -hmm. few years ago. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the, the hype is kind of goofy, but it's also good. I usually like to sort of, instead of jumping into the next big thing, I like to sit on the sidelines, see if the whole thing <laughs> crashes. And if after the crash, you know, see what pieces are left and if there's merit there, I might consider them, but uh, I'm the same with blockchain. Like, I don't know in any Bitcoin, for example, yet. I'm still 50-50 on whether it's worth investing in. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, I'm digressing. No, but I absolutely agree in that. And that's kind of bringing us back to the genesis of like the whole conversation and kind of the genesis of neural DSP as well. Like the best way kind of to consider machine learning, like if you're figuring out like where should I implement it, what should I do with it, is to just consider it as a catalyst. No more, no less. So... If you're Netflix, you have a recommendation algorithm that has a performance. Mm -hmm. If you implement some machine learning into it, the performance might increase. But it's probably you shouldn't think about it as something transformative or something that is necessarily unlocking something that was impossible before. It's just making something a bit more efficient 
in such a way that it becomes commercially feasible to do it in that way. Like that's mm-hmm. a much more healthy way of thinking about it rather than considering like, oh, what's the next transformative or new thing that we can start doing with this? Like, it, for example, in the case of neural DSP, the way that I hear it is you had the best people and you had the best vision and machine learning became just a key that opened some of the key locks that enabled mm-hmm. you to do what you do, but like kind of no more, no less in that sense. Yeah, it was a catalyst, but uh, but yeah, it wasn't the holy grail or the end of be all. Although it ended up being a lot closer to that than, than we originally expected, but but that was just a coincidence. I mean, mm. yeah, I mean, at the end, it all works out because I think where there's substance and merit, things will tend to go all right. Yeah. And when there's just people trying to use hype words to defraud users or uh, investors, these people will inevitably fail. And I think the people that are vulnerable to get scammed, you know, investors and consumers mm-hmm. tend to get sophisticated very quickly and, and, and uh, one would hope at least. And we're starting to reach the end part of the podcast, but before we do, I'd love to spend just a few more minutes on quad cortex um, because mm-hmm. it, like the flagship of neural DSP. Um, so just to clarify, quad cortex is a physical device that basically the sounds and the models that neural DSP produces lives within that. And in other words, it's also an edge device from an engineering perspective because you have a dedicated chipset inside that is aimed to run the inference of everything that you do. So can you talk a little bit about, because you've had the vision for Quad Cortex for quite some time, as the way that I hear it, like from day one, like how has how's the journey been for you so far? Like first you've had to start doing the modeling of the actual amps and the sounds, and then you've had to implement them into a physical edge device. So can you talk a little bit about your Quad Cortex development journey? Sure. I mean, all these things happen in, in quite in parallel, actually. So uh, the same time that we're wondering, okay, which screen size do we need and, and which suppliers do we want or are we going to use cnc aluminum or die casting when we're sort of considering all these very early things we already had people working on the algorithms and that's why we we started doing plugins actually was because a plugin is basically a software product that's you know like it's like a one percent of the development of a quad cortex but you don't need to minus all the other development right Mm. minus all the hardware manufacturing and all the other models you need for the quad to be competitive in the market. So the plugins were initially uh, a really sort of sort of like desperate attempt to make some money and, and build so building a brand way before we could have reasonably expected to have the quad cortex ready. Mm. So we had this that's why we had these two things in parallel. And in a way it enabled the quad cortex, but also it it took a lot of time because of course the, the entire team was doing a lot of work for the plugins and I was busy closing deals with artists or brands. Uh, my co-founder who was running a lot of the Quad Cortex, you know, UX and UI design with the with the designers was also busy doing the same for the plugins and same with the engineers. So it was like this very interesting process in which you had these two paths and, and they were sort of congruent, but also mm. the congruency wasn't a hundred percent. So it, in a way, it made the product possible, but it also delayed it quite a bit. Yeah. But I mean, it was really grueling. I think for the last, for the last three years, four years, uh, it's been sort of like constant crisis mode because first it was like just development stuff, like nothing was working and, and, and you know, you're running out of money and mm-hmm. what do you do? Then we, after, you know, suffering through like almost every week, there was this like existential threat. Uh, that we had to figure it out from scratch. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like the Silicon Valley show, you know, it's like, like, yeah. like you solve one thing and then you get a lawsuit or, you know, like <laughs> it was like, like every, not really lawsuits, but, but, you know, like, like kind of like this cataclysmic events yeah, one yeah. after the other for months. And well, you, I think that the startup experience is, is quite universal in that sense that it's just mm-hmm. horrendously stressful and, and uh, the mentally challenging, like, you know, emotionally challenging. Anyway, yeah. so, First, yeah, we had like kind of like the, the sort of inherent startup pains of, of you know, funding and, and recruiting and trying to do this very ambitious product uh, that you don't know if it's going to work and it's also very expensive. And then once you maybe overcome that, okay, then we announced the product in 2020, in January 2020, mm. huge release. We pre-sold like 5 million euros in two days. It was beyond our expectations at the NAMM show, which is the biggest trade show in the music industry. Our booth was by far the, the fullest. Uh, all the reps from the biggest shops that weren't even replying to my emails were now queuing to give me their business card, apologizing. Yeah, sorry, I told you I didn't have any time. 
I made time, you know. Yeah. Uh, so everything works out, and we're like, okay, now we're golden. Uh, yeah. We we have production ongoing. The software will probably be, you know, sort of ready for prime time in six to twelve months. Mm. Great. And then COVID happens, and you're like, holy fuck, okay, now now we have a pandemic going on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we sort of did all the manufacturing, all the sourcing, and everything through the pandemic and chip shortages. So we had to implement these very strict safety procedure rules in our factory because if mm. somebody you know now if somebody shows up with covid they just go home and that's it like yeah some people might get nobody cares but you know two years ago it was like very serious like you might shut down you might have to shut down your whole operation for a couple of weeks and that, mm. that would have been that would have been catastrophic right so i mean it, it, it's the whole thing is just this like constant it's like this constant struggle to be honest you just saw one thing and then the next is surely around the corner mm. And I think that's one of the main things I tell all my friends that want to start a company is like, you know, I, I give them a very honest sort of overview of what my life is like. And, you know, and things are going great. Like I, I'm, I'm like on the lucky 10% that didn't go bankrupt in two years. Yeah. And it's like, it, is this truly what you want for your life? Like, do you really think you're, you're willing to go through this? And, you know, if the answer is like, oh, fuck you, I, I, you won't tell me what to do. I'm doing it anyway. Then, then I know, okay, you, you, you might have a chance. But if, my 15 minutes sort of complaining litany of how difficult it is is enough to dissuade you from trying it. You're never going to make it because like that, that's yeah. nothing. I mean, like somebody not believing in you, it's nothing. Like yeah. most people don't believe in you. Like your first customers don't believe in you. The first people, employees you approach don't believe. Like nobody will believe in you in the beginning. Yeah. You have to earn that, you know, credibility. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's hard, but, but to be honest, that's why, that's why it's so important to me. I think that through this struggle you're forced to to achieve these dreams. You have to become a much better version of yourself than when you start. Mm. The best catalyst for the growth and learning is challenges and sometimes downright suffering. Is you know, it's like failing miserably and then figuring out why, like why are you doing wrong, uh, and also not just sort of in the execution and the the skill part of running a company or creating a brand, but it's also in your own psychology. Like how mm. do you react to things? Yeah. Learning how to deal with uncertainty. You know, learning how to deal with hopelessness you know like can you actually go through months of just hopelessness and still do what you know needs to get done even if it feels pointless just because you know that that's the right thing to do like learning those skills and, and that resilience is key and it's very useful in life in general but you don't you can't buy it and you're not born with it it's something that you need to it's like you know it's like getting a black belt in jiu-jitsu like there's no amount of money you can put on the problem or or genetics that you can put in the problem that, that will give you that. Like you need to earn it through a decade of just getting strangled, yeah. <laughs> destroyed on the mats every day. And I think entrepreneurship is very similar. And for me, that makes it not just an occupation. For me, it's a vehicle for forging meaning, uh, like existential meaning. And that's why I love it so much. And that's why I'm willing to put up with all this shit, to be honest, <laughs> because I believe that it will make me better at some point. Here, here. That's... <laughs> That's beautifully put. So, Doc, we're starting to reach the end part of the episode. Um, but as is customary in inference, we predict the future. Ooh. And I'd love to get a prediction out of you. So how do you see, which direction do you see the professional music technology taking within the next five years? Like, what are going to be the major trends or some of the things that are looming within your horizon when we talk about professional music technology development? So, I think... One of the great benefits of technical advancement for creators is the democratization of good sound. Because, you know, with products like ours, now for a hundred bucks, you can get thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Mm. Um, with a Focusrite 100 euro interface, you don't need, and, and our software, you know, for a few hundred bucks, you don't need to go to a studio that will charge you a grand a day or more. So mm. that democratization, like the, the sort of monetary threshold needed to, to create good sounding music has been lowered. And that's great. And that's been going on steadily for the last 20 years. Mm. I think the the missing the missing element to have like an explosion in, in the number of people that are actually recording and self-producing and publishing music online mm. is to democratize the amount of skill you need to go from your cool music idea to a good sounding song. Mm. So mm. what I hope, I'm not really making a prediction, but what I hope will happen, uh, and we'll definitely try to contribute to this, is actually using machine learning create tools that will help people automate a lot of the difficult and sort of like nerdy parts of 
recording music, you know, like sound engineering and, and mastering. Mm. Uh, so that now for a few hundred bucks, you have access to the best sounding software. And also with tools, you can recreate the results that, you know, a thousand dollar per truck mixing a mastering engineer would charge you mm. for, you know, again, like a hundred X less money. So I think, yeah, automating more portions of, of music production so that now there's a creator in everyone. And with that, Douglas, thank you so much for coming on. For anyone listening, I do strongly, strongly, strongly recommend if there's an even an ounce of musician in your body, I recommend to check out Neural DSP's website and some of the products they have. As I, I believe you have a 14-day trial for all of the plugins there. Yep, you can try it for free. And please do follow Doug as well. Like at least your Instagram is absolutely amazing. So Doug Darklass, <laughs> go go yes. and have a follow. Um, there's... Because one of the things that I love about the social media presence of Neural DSP and Dark Class is the fact that you share the creations of all of the people who use the products and are proud enough to push them out. So you're basically a forum for them to basically portray the skills and what they've achieved using the products that you've built. Of course, yeah. That's very fun actually to see how people use them and, and you know, happy if we can give them a bit more visibility. So yeah, if you use our products, tag me at Dot Darkless and uh, at Neural DSP and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll repost, share. Lovely. Doug, once more, thank you so much for coming on and for anyone listening, have a great day.